Okay. Um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. I welcome you all to our last uh, web session uh, from the African Commons Conference. Uh, today we are going to be focusing on how to get published on African Commons. My name is Menelis Falai, I'll be your moderator. I'm a PhD candidate at uh, Rhodes University and also I'm an IS uh, C Early Career Network member. I will introduce uh, to you our panelists. Uh, our panelists uh, include uh, Arun Agrawal from uh, University of Michigan, USA. Uh, he is the editor in chief of World uh, Development. And also we have uh, Marco Janssen from Arizona State University in the US. He is the editor in chief of uh, ecology and society. And also we have uh, Michael Schoon from Arizona State University. He is the editor in chief of the International Journal of the Commons. Mm -hmm. So just uh, a brief uh, to explain on our format. Uh, the panelists, we have uh, five minutes each to introduce themselves. Uh, and then I, as the moderator, I'll ask uh, the panelists questions, and then the um, and then I'll take questions from the participants. Uh, please note that this webinar is being recorded. Uh, you can write your questions in the in the chat box. Uh, you can direct your question whether to Arun or Mike or, or Marco, and then I'll ask uh, them the questions. So right now I'll give. Uh, this opportunity to Arun. Over very to much Arun. Arun. And uh, thank you to everyone who has uh, called in to this webinar and the Zoom meeting. Uh, I'm very happy to be a part of this conversation and uh, I'm also happy to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, as uh, Menelisi already said, I'm a faculty member at the University of uh, Michigan, and I teach here in the School for Environment and Sustainability. I've been here for more than 15 years, which seems like a long time. And I've been, uh, I started editing world development uh, roughly about seven years ago. Uh, seven, maybe, eight, yeah, this is the eighth year of my editing the journal. And uh, they, uh, most of you uh, may already have heard of it, but for those of you who have, who don't know about it, it's one of the oldest journals publishing research on development and sustainability. More, more in, an increasing amount of work on sustainability as the importance of this topic and the importance of sustainability for development has grown and as development itself in the mainstream has become much more about sustainable development. Uh, Menelisi, did you want me to talk about the journal already or did you want everybody to introduce and then to go back to talking about the journal? I you to introduce yourself uh, and what your, your journal entails. So you can do the, the whole presentation and uh, introduce the journal and then we'll move to, to Marco. Okay, so I will take maybe just five minutes to say a few things uh, about my experience as editor of World Development and what are some of the issues that you would you should pay attention to when trying to publish, uh, not just in World Development but also but generally in any in any journal that may uh, be interested in research on the commons in Africa. So I'll share my screen. It's a very small presentation, just three slides, and focusing on three different issues to keep in mind when you're putting together your research. So the first thing uh, I want to talk about is uh, the framing of your work. So most journals uh, most good journals receive many, many more papers than they can publish. They receive many more papers than they can send out for review. So the first thing you want to do is to frame your 
work with a title that should appeal or that links to other work and to the mission and goals of the journal. The title is probably the most important part of what you are doing in your article in terms of getting it published. Obviously, the substance and the argument is the most important part in terms of the uh, uh, importance of the article. But in terms of trying to get it published, you really need to focus and think about uh, a good title that attracts attention, that is appealing, and that links to what the journalist, journal's mission and scope are. The second most important part of your article is the abstract. And the abstract should be clear. It should, uh, there are a lot of places that you can get detailed guidelines on writing your abstract. Uh, well, development has a, 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 a line by line guidance on our website for how to write an abstract and how long it should be. Uh, and you should pay attention to that and you should pay attention to the guidelines from the journal about your articles, uh, putting together your article. And then the third thing you should do is in your cover letter to the, I often get articles that have no cover letter and you can get away with it if you're very well established in the field, but if you're not, you want to write a cover letter that clearly outlines the importance and the relevance of your article to the field and the journal. So these are three things that all editors will read in your submission, the title, the abstract, and the cover letter. Many times if, the article or the article's title abstract or the cover letter don't provide sufficient interest to the editor. Many, in, in many cases, the editor will stop right there and not go any further. So all the work that you have done in putting together the article will get wasted. So really pay attention to framing in terms of the title, the abstract and showing in your cover letter why this article is relevant to the field and to the journal. Content, I won't say too much because there is a lot of uh, uh, variability in the kind of content that an article on the commons can have. But the three things that really are important and will make or break your article are, one, indicating extremely transparently why the work that you have written about, why the work that you have written is conceptually and substantively or practically important. So bring out this issue of, why you have done what you have done. Why should anybody else care about it? The second thing that you must bring out clearly in your article is what is the novelty? What is the additional work that your additional insight, additional contribution that your article is making? And then the third thing I'd say is pay attention to language. Uh, I see far too many papers that are not uh, written in in sufficiently careful, uh, clear English, and there are editing mistakes, there are style errors, there are there are grammar mistakes, there are uh, awkwardly written sentences, and they are they you know they should not sub they should not uh, detract from the from the importance of your work, but they do, but they do. Editors feel bad about sending such articles for review because it conveys a bad impression about the journal's uh, 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 screening process. So make it easy for the editor. You know, if you pay attention to these three things, you are helping the editor and therefore yourself in getting published. And finally, I will say three other things with regards to paying attention to the journal. And these are true for world development, but they would be true for any journal to whom you send your paper. One, the methods you use in your article for analyzing your data or for carrying out a review or for providing some uh, set of reflections, it should match with the kinds of methods that are being used in other articles published in the journal. So one of the things that you should do when you send your article to a journal is to look at what they have published before, look at the methods they have used, and be sure that you are using methods that are attractive to the journal. If you send a very highly quantitative or game theoretic or agent-based modeling paper to a journal that doesn't publish work like that, even if the topic and the and the and the uh, conclusions are right exactly what the journal is interested in, it will it will convey an impression that you haven't thought carefully about where you should publish. Second, look at the editors. Look at the editor in chief. In this case, it would mean 
Mike and Marco and the kind of work they are doing. Everybody has hidden biases. I have them. And so if you are doing work that can connect to what the editors are doing, not just necessarily the editor in chief, but also the associate editors, it will help you uh, get attract, get some interest from them. And uh, in some cases, uh, you can mention which editor you would like to look at your work. And often the editor in chief uh, or whoever the screening person is will pay attention to that. And finally, connect your work to the both the mission and the past work that the journal has published because it will help the editors get the sense that you've thought about what you're doing and the fit of your work to the journal to which you're sending it. So I'm gonna stop over here. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions on these or any other topics that you might have regarding publishing, but over to back to you, Melissa. Thank you so much, Arun. Um, I can see here we have got over 46 participants. Uh, I'm expecting questions from the participants. You can use the chat box down there to write your questions. Uh, this time I'll give uh, Marco to make his short presentation. Over to you, Marco. Okay, thank you, Lizzie. Um, I'm Marco Jansa. I'm a professor in the School of Sustainability at Arizona State University. Um, I'm also about 15 years uh, um, at Arizona State University, which also sounds uh, a long time in various departments um, um, over the time. Um, I uh, started a year ago uh, being the co-editor-in-chief of Ecology and Society. Ecology and Society is um, around uh, for uh, about uh, 25 years. Uh, it is an online journal and the uh, um, and so it started with C.S. Holling, uh, who, who was the founding uh, editor-in-chief. It was part of the Resilience Alliance. And um, it is a journal where um, there is, as a, as a background in ecology, but likes to connect ecology with, uh, with the social sciences. I took over from Kale Falke, uh, Falke and um, I'm co-editing uh, in chief with Lance uh, Gunderson. So I would like to say a little bit about the, the process. I already see a question that I, uh, I want to explain. Uh, maybe it helps to, uh, to say a little bit about the process of what we are doing. Yes, we get many more uh, uh, manuscripts than we can handle. So what do we mean with that? So uh, Ecology Society, we get about 500 manuscripts and about 30 to 40% we are not sending out for review. Uh, we, we reject that. So what do we, why do we do this? Um, we, well, we are looking at the uh, uh, whether it meets the, the topic. So uh, Ecology and Society is a very interdisciplinary journal and you get a, well, uh, you can include many things in that topic. So um, it's, it's somewhat a gray area sometimes about what fits and what doesn't fit. And that's also why it is important to, to write this letter because uh, uh, I have to make that judgment uh, why it fits that journal, and sometimes uh, uh, it seems not to be the best uh, best fit uh, to to the to the journal. So that's why we then uh, uh, one reason why it might not fit is that we we don't think we can find appropriate reviewers in our review board or to to evaluate them. It might be better for another journal. So. Um, so that's the main reason why we we de uh, disreject. And if we uh, see that, or whether we see that the quality is at the level that we will, uh, it's very likely that it will be rejected. So if it might fit the journal, I skim the the the, the content. And if it seems to be that uh, there are some some issues with it, then. Um, uh, that I can evaluate, then I will uh, also uh, send it back. If I, it is an issue that I do not know, 
then uh, I will always send it out to uh, an editor and um, will then um, from the editorial board will then find other people to review. If somebody else says, no, we should not send it out, then we also send it back. So why, why do we have this pre uh, uh, kind of uh, scanning is that it takes all the edit, uh, all the reviewing is voluntary work. And so it sometimes take say 20 invitations for people to review a paper to get actually two people to do it. it that's why it sometimes takes a long time to get uh, reviews. It's not that people are necessary uh, take a long time to review. It's very difficult to find uh, the appropriate review. So that's why that's a, a, a challenge. So I get typically on a weekly basis about 10 review requests, which I largely reject now because I didn't hit the journal, but a lot of people get too many requests for uh, reviews. And so um, that's, that's a scarcity. So that's why we are not, uh, why we do desk reviews if we um, uh, judge whether papers are not uh, uh, appropriate. So uh, some people suggest uh, potential reviews, which is helpful. It's not that we necessarily take uh, those advice, but it gives at least a, a, a direction of which uh, area to, to look for reviews. So that's an important uh, uh, point. Another uh, issue which I would like to uh, mention that I see a lot is, um, especially with work related to the comments, is that a number of manuscripts are very descriptive and they don't really make a case about how this contributes to the broader uh, knowledge domain. So uh, people may say, well, I am applying uh, the IAD framework to a particular case that has never done before. That is not very interesting to the, to, uh, to the broader community. Um, that might be interesting for the, the, the kind of the, the local stakeholders, but not for the, um, the international community of, uh, of researchers. And so, um, it is it can be hard if you do some interesting work so to frame it in a way that this might be interesting for the broader international scholarly community but that's that's what those journals are for you might have a case uh, so i do for example some work in northern uh, us on lakes i don't uh, lake governance it's not that i am particularly focused on um, 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 the, 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 the lakes about, I am, uh, uh, that's, I use, I use those cases to, to make a study, uh, to test particular hypotheses that I can do in a unique situation that in Wisconsin, there are thousands of lakes very close to each other and I can do research to test some hypotheses that will be of broader interest. If I will just say, of, well, I am applying the IAD framework to uh, lakes in Wisconsin, that would not be of interest. But if I will frame it in a way, I can now do something that is very difficult to do in other places. There's a unique natural situation that I can do some, uh, test some hypothesis that will be of interest to the broader community. That's how you will frame that for, uh, for such a paper, actually. We submitted a paper to the International Journal of the Commons uh, recently. Um, so that's very important. And that is, I see that's uh, a common um, a challenge for people uh, who might be uh, relatively junior in submitting their papers. They are focused on their case, but don't think about the broader context. So uh, when you write your introduction, think about why should, should anybody read your paper? Uh, one thing is to get uh, to, to say, to do your master thesis or PhD, you have a committee who has to read it. But if, if you are publishing it in a journal, you have to think of why would anybody be interested in reading your paper? It's because it contributes to issues that other people are interested in. And so you have to make that case. And that's uh, also what, in a way, Arun indicated with the framing. I will leave it to here and then uh, I will give it back to Alicia. 
Thank you so much, Marco, for that. Um, I'll end uh, over to Mike Skun. Over to you, Mike. Thanks, Menelisi. Um, so um, I'm Mike Skun. I'm an associate professor at Arizona State University in the School of Sustainability, along with um, with Marco, and um, have been the editor in chief or co-editor in chief with Frank van Lerhoven and now uh, Sergio Villamayor Tomas. Um, at the journal, I've, I've been with the journal for uh, 10 years, and the journal has been around for 14. It's an online journal as well. It's open access. Um, it's the flagship journal of IASC. And in, in our model, the authors pay for publication, um, and then access is free to, to anyone, that, any of the readership. Um, much of our readership and authorship is from uh, developing countries and and so that's why we've set up the, we're set up the way we are we've tried to keep our fees relatively low um, they continue to go up a little bit with uh, increases in copy editing but we've tried to keep it uh, open so that uh, people in the in the countries that are being researched and that are uh, conducting research uh, can read them um, one of the challenges we have, and this echoes something that Marco said, is that we get a lot of case studies submitted. And I, I would emphasize, as, as Marco did, that these need to uh, be based on theory and say something new, not just taking um, an existing framework or some ideas and applying them in a new place. There needs to be something um, innovative in, in what the research is. This has to be something that that others are going to want to see and to read um, and be interested in. Uh, additionally, one of the challenges uh, that, that we often see, uh, particularly in um, young scholars, is that they, um, they write and write and write. We end up with very long papers, and I would say that there's a uh, direct relationship between um, the length of the paper and the number of people that read it. Um, as the paper gets longer and longer, fewer and fewer want to read it, especially all the way through. Um, so I would try to uh, remain con as concise as possible. Um, also, um, broadly speaking, but particularly with case studies, uh, you want to think about generalizability. And I, I don't say that strictly or solely in a, um, in a scientific manner. Um, but also in terms of reader interest, you want, if you're writing a case study about a particular place, there needs to be something compelling that makes me as a reader, not as an editor, uh, not exclusively as an editor, want to, want to read it. What is it about your case that, that's compelling, that's of interest? Um, for our journal, we also want to see ties back to the commons. This echoes a little bit of what Arun was saying to know your journal. Um, For a, for a submission to IJC, it does not need to be institutional analysis in an Ostrom style framework. However, it does need to have something about the commons or commoning or common pool resources, something that uh, links it to our, our um, general readership. And I think most social ecological systems and research around them have these issues in them, but you need to call attention to that. As Arun noted, um, this can be done in, this should be done in the letter uh, to the editor, um, as well as the abstract. Let us know that you know what our journal is about and that your, your uh, manuscript fits uh, with our journal. Uh, more broadly speaking, for uh, particularly for, for students and young scholars in academic publishing, the advice that, that I received as a grad student, I think, holds very true, and that is to keep writing, uh, keep writing, keep writing, keep writing, and you will uh, get published. Um, have it proofread by someone else if, if, you're, if you have any concerns about language. As, as Arun noted, this is a, a great frustration when we see um, a, a paper that, that is, is really um, poorly written. And then once, once you have a paper, uh, your best effort paper, send it out and keep sending it out. 
we've all been uh, rejected. We've all had revise and resubmits. If you fail once, fix it, use the advice from that you receive if it's been reviewed and send it out again. Um, don't, don't just sit on it, don't give up, don't uh, just set it aside, but try to fix it, try to improve it and keep sending it out. Um, I know that I've submitted to journals and had a rejection and then I uh, make some changes and send it out to, uh, to higher impact journals and they're accepted there. Um, so it's, it's very hit or miss sometimes. We don't always know what people are going to be receptive to and responsive to um, until you send it out. So my advice is to always uh, have a paper in good form, send it and see what the reviewers think, see what the editors uh, have to say. Um, as has already been said, so I'll keep this brief, um, research the journals and think about which one is most appropriate uh, for your research and for your paper. If you have not written the paper, try to write in a style that fits the journal that you're targeting. If you've already written a paper, make sure that it's appropriate for, for the journal that you wanna send it to. Um, the body of literature that you use, the methods and approaches, the format, all of this. Um, I think that's all that I had to say for, for right now, and I'm looking forward to these questions. It look like, looks like there's some good ones in there already. Thanks, Menelisti. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Mike. I can see that I've got over seven questions. So I tried by all means to categorize them um, into three different sections. The first one is about ethics. The other one is about development. And the other one is about um, article processing charge. Okay, my first question um, comes from uh, Francois. Um, he says, this one is directed uh, to, um, to Marco, uh, whether journals can publish articles written in French. I received this uh, question uh, last night. Uh, the question is whether can journals publish articles written in French? Failing uh, to that, can they translate these articles back into English? That's the first question. This one is directed to Marco. And uh, the second question is directed to Arun. Uh, it's about uh, ethics. I saw a, uh, a, a question from Sharon Poland. Uh, she says here, what if one is dealing with sensitive issues in the commons like corruption? This is a reality and is more and more relevant in the political economy of uh, natural resources. It seems no one wants to publish if this is included. Uh, can you elaborate more on that, uh, Arun? And then the last question goes uh, to Mike. Uh, the question came from um, Evaristo. Uh, he says the African scholars on the commons tend to be less published. What are some of the mechanisms that journal editors put in place to publish young or emerging uh, scholars from regions such as Africa? Uh, we'll start with uh, you, Marco, you can answer the, the first question. Okay, yes, and I, I, I got a question last night about, or yesterday about this, about the language, and also I see one other question. Yes, so our journals, uh, the three which are, we present here are published in English, so it, and I don't want to speak about the other journals, but Ecology and Society, we, yes, we, we, we publish in English um, and, uh, and there's, we, we, I don't expect people change that. Um, I understand there is a language barrier. My native language is not English either. So and I'll still uh, have uh, challenges still with, with English, although I live now for a while in the US. It's not my native language and I, I, I understand uh, the, the language uh, issues and uh, typically I'm pretty kind of lenient when somebody submit a uh, paper which is interesting but has some language issues but in the end it's up to the authors to uh, uh, provide a paper that uh, uh, meet the quality standards of uh, proper English. Um, so why don't we publish in French, Spanish, Chinese, Dutch, German, or anything else, it's we then we will need to have people who will be able to review those uh, 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 
uh, papers in all these different languages, have to proofread it in these different languages. That becomes a very uh, complicated uh, uh, issue. So, uh, and yeah, ideally we will have one world lang language that everybody can read. Um, and I, I don't want to, I don't think we want to impose that it is a particular language, uh, uh, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's how it is. I have published uh, my own work in different languages. Uh, I, I, yes, I have, I'm not, no, I don't have published an actual article in French, but I have in German, uh, Spanish, uh, Dutch, uh, I have even a publication that's, and I have even published a book in Chinese, which is only available in Chinese and people wonder why there is no English version. But the, well, why I'm doing this is that typically this, uh, is a collaboration with a colleague who writes in that, uh, other language and, um, and that ends up publishing in another language because I want to reach out to this other language. Um, so if you want to publish in ecology and society, you have to submit it in English. It's just that we will uh, not have the bandwidth to publish it in another language because, and you don't want to have automatic translation of your article. Words matter. Uh, we did a conference, we had automatic translation of the, the, the talks. That may be a reasonable with talks, but if you, uh, may have noticed the translation is not perfect and you don't want to have that uh, with an article and and so it's uh, if we would go to any other language then which languages and then it becomes very uh, costly to 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 do this so it's we yeah it's it, I have unfortunately and I do not know which uh, French journals are publishing uh, on the comments. So that might be other people may have an idea about that. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Marco. Uh, over to you, Mike, uh, on the question. Okay. This is the question on uh, getting published as a developing scholar or a scholar in Africa? Yes. Yeah. Um, we are uh, quite interested in, in these types of publications. Um, there's quite a, quite a lot that is published in our journal. Um, we're uh, talking about a, a potential special issue on um, commons in Africa based on the outcomes of the conference. Um, that's that's not confirmed yet, but we're we're trying to figure that out now. Um, so I think it's it's uh, it, this this is is quite common. If if people have articles, I would I would send them. We have African scholars on our board, um, and a lot of African specialists on our board. Okay. Um, um, before you leave, Mike, I, I have a question from Ben here. He says, um, "What would you?" consider a concise paper? It's a question directed to you. So I think we have a, I think the word limit on our website says 8,000 words and I think that's a lot. Um, I would I would say if if you can keep it to 6,000 words, I think that's a better, better length. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, over to you, Arun, uh, on the question in terms of uh, ethics from Sharon Poland. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I answered that question in the chat already. I wrote an answer to that question. But uh, I would say, so, you know, there are two issues with publishing. One is all the issues that are obvious and which are on the surface. And the suggestions I gave and the points I made in my uh, brief presentation are mostly focused on the obvious issues that can help you publish in a good journal. But then there are a whole lot of non-obvious or non-transparent uh, issues which are often 
not even known to the editors who are making decisions or to the reviewers who are going through your manuscript. And these are the hidden biases that you might have against some topics, against some methods, or against some countries and institutions and younger or less well-known scholars. And these are very hard to address. These are very hard to address. So Sharon, your question about corruption, I, I would say, yes, of course, it is a very important point. And at one level, when you write about corruption, especially corruption that as you might have seen it in some specific instances, it is very important to be uh, to, to ensure the privacy and confidentiality of your respondents. Uh, but, you know, just in terms of the obvious, like, surface uh, point, I would say World Development has published articles on corruption, and I can think of many other journals that would be willing to publish articles on corruption. But it's possible that some editors would have a hidden bias against publishing on corruption. But there's a very large and thriving literature on corruption in relation to development and relation to sustainability. So it's not, it's not the case that you can't publish. It may be that some editors of some journals may have some implicit, unstated bias against publishing work on corruption. But even there, you know, the things that I said in terms of framing, in terms of matching your work to the kinds of stuff that gets published in the journal, in terms of the content of your article, and some of the things also which, which have been highlighted by Mike and Marco, I think they can help you, they can help you improve the chances of your paper being sent out for review, right? And once it goes out for review, then of course, it's very hard to say what the reviewers will say. I, I very often deal with submissions where the paper gets sent out for review and one author say, one reviewer says minor revisions and the other says reject. And so, you know, once you send out the paper for review, it really does, the editor has thought it is worth publishing, but they do, we do rely on what reviewers tell us because we don't know most of the fields for which we get papers. I mean, yes, on African Commons, I can assess the paper myself. Uh, so the only issue is do I have time? But in general, when you send a paper out for review, you base your decision ultimately on the advice of the reviewers. Uh, but I would say it is possible to publish on corruption. Uh, it's not, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Arun. And um, we are now moving to our second round of questions. And uh, these ones will be directed to all of you. Um, we have uh, a question from Kofi. Uh, he's saying, we often receive advertising from journal to submit papers. Some of them look like uh, spam or hoax, predatory journals. I think that's what he's meaning. A good journal made a good journal make publicity. Couldn't get that. A yep. good journals made public, something like that. Yeah, we are yeah. not sending out emails to say we need another paper. Uh, we get too many papers to 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 process. So as I mentioned, that we get about five hundred a year. I think uh, Arun has many more. Uh, so. It's very difficult to, uh, uh, given that we depend on our volunteering to uh, uh, to get reviews for all these. Uh, uh, so we get more than we can handle. So we are not sending out solicitations. Uh, yes, I would say the good journals have no need for sending out those journals. I will I automatically delete those kind of emails. Uh, don't see it be an appropriate uh, way to. Uh, but if you are a new journal, there might be some calls uh, to, to um, but but that will be more of uh, special issues, uh, etc. Not say we need to have a paper from you and you are an established scholar. Yeah, Arun, I see you want to say something. So, so uh, normally I only want to agree with Marco. Everything he says, I want to say yes. <laughs> but in, in this case, I must say. 
one thing, which is a small disagreement, which is that you could, you know, so it is true, we get a lot of papers and I'm always complaining about the papers, number of papers we get, but uh, just recently we did send out solicitations for two special issues. One, when Esther Duflo and uh, Banerjee and uh, Kramer won the Nobel Prize and we said we would like to do a special issue on the use of experiments in work on development and sustainability. And that was, uh, that was uh, uh, different from everything we published because we said we only want short contributions, roughly between 1,500 to 2,000 words because we wanted to publish the special issue as soon as possible after the Nobel Prize was announced. And then a second special issue we did, uh, which was, uh, which has almost killed me, uh, was because of COVID. We said we would like to do a special issue on COVID pandemics and development. And we did issue a call for that and we publicized it uh, as much as we could. Uh, a little too successfully because we got 650 papers as a result of that. And that's twice the number of papers we get in one month. So it was just, it had been very, very hard to keep up with the, with the number of papers we have gotten in the last three, four months. But, but normally you're right. Normally yeah. Marco is right. We don't normally send out letters saying, yeah. please submit a paper to us. But, but you can see from a request if World Development says we have a special reason to do a special uh, issue, then that's something different than, uh, uh, we read your work, which of course they never did, and uh, you, uh, where you want to submit your latest so that it will be uh, published next month. That's, that's yes. uh, not a, uh, you, you should delete those kind of emails. Yes, I, I, I got a recent letter like that from MDPI, and yeah. they said we have read your work and it has got a lot of attention and we would like you to publish at a discount. <laughs> so I wrote them back saying, if you, give me, if you give me tokens for publishing 100 free papers with you, I will share them with colleagues from poor countries or from institutions which don't have resources. And if you agree to that, then I will publish a paper with you. <laughs> I haven't heard back from them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I would just add in, in, in contrast, I think that all of our, our journals um, focus uh, attention on publicizing the papers that have been published and using social media to try to outreach and showcase the work of, of and scholarship um, from our authors. Okay, uh, I've got uh, one personal question. I think I can ask this as the, the moderator. Um, my question is, uh, as an early career scientist from Africa, um, our institutions, they've got more just to none the budget. Uh, there's the issue of article processing charge. What are the journals, um, Mike's journal and Marco's journal, you are doing about the article processing charge? Because I believe we do good research, but we don't have, sometimes we don't have the money to pay for the article processing charge. Yes, so I saw there is a question about that too. So um, we we give away waivers, but you have to, in a way, in, uh, ask that in advance and we have to agree to it. So when we do that, when uh, the, the authors are all um, um, students or all um, um, from, um, say, Global South, um, but asked before that, not at the end. So we charge, they say the, the, the money we charge uh, is, is a little bit more than the cost, so we can uh, provide waivers. Um, but we are, you know, a selective with that, so that uh, it's, we, when I, I remember the, the anecdotes that, that Buzz Holland gave in, when they started, that people did not want to uh, pay for the publication fees and yeah I'm a professor at Harvard and I cannot pay the, the, the publication fee. That's not that we you know, uh, give a waiver. Um, but so and we want to have that in advance that we know but we give waivers to people from the global south and, uh, and if they are all students. Yeah. Okay. Yes our, our policy is, is the same. Um, if a waiver is asked for, um, for both of those reasons, either because it's an early career uh, researcher or from the Global South, um, we likewise, we need those uh, requests 
uh, when the article is submitted so that we know that we're looking at something. And that does not influence our decision one way or another. It doesn't keep you from being published. It doesn't change the review process at all. Um, we, but we do need to know that so we can, we can start to set aside funds for this. Um, we, or rather, we have funds set aside and we continue to uh, use, use the, uh, a portion of the publishing fee uh, from others towards that. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Arun, do you have a comment? Uh, yeah, I think the, so World Development is a gated journal, right? It's not, it's not an open access journal. So I think the issues around uh, article publication charges are not directly relevant to world development that, in that we don't charge anything for publishing a paper. I think the issues really arise after we have published a paper because unlike uh, journals that have a publishing charge for all articles with uh, exceptions uh, that, that Mike and Marco have pointed out, uh, where the papers are free to all the readers. In our case, we, we uh, I say we, but I should say in our case, Elsevier does not usually make articles free. Uh, I can recommend one article for every issue that it be uh, open access uh, just because of the importance of the topic or the article itself or whatever, for whatever reason, and they would do that. Uh, but but uh, normally they don't do it. So I think uh, overall, I would say that there are, uh, I mean, obviously uh, the two journals that Mike, Mike and Marco have talked about, they are very well regarded, very well established, very important journals for scholars of the commons. But many of the new uh, journals that, that are basically existing to make profits from the article publication, uh, article uh, publication, uh, uh, the, the page fees that they charge, I find them very objectionable. And I find those uh, objectionable because really the only thing that they are looking for is how to make money from publishing the articles by squeezing the authors as much as possible. So MDPI, I think every single journal, some of them are very high impact factor. Some of them publish very good articles. They're publishing five, six, seven, ten thousand 10,000 papers every year in one journal. In one of their journals, there are, right now there were 1,000 open special issues. Open special issues for one journal, 1,000. 1, I mean, I find that just, uh, a complete a complete perversion of what publication of ideas is about so you know i i don't know what to say it's a, it's a i can't say that elsevier or any of the springer etc the the model they have of charging very high fees to institutions or to anybody to make uh, access possible for articles they publish i can't say that is good but I also cannot say that the open access model, the way it is working for many new commercial journals, I don't think that is good either. Uh, yes, I agree. Yeah. I, I uh, am not reviewing for uh, those, uh, was it MDPI, uh, that, that uh, uh, journal, which I'm not sure whether to reject any uh, paper. So, um, the fact that we reject papers is a, is a good sign in a way. So it's not that we are focusing on, uh, we want to publish, uh, we want to publish only uh, uh, papers that, that meet uh, uh, quality criteria. And uh, so uh, actually I, my task as the editor chief is only to deal with the, uh, the, the, the quality of the papers. I don't deal with any of the, the, the money. So uh, I, I actually do not know whether uh, papers have gotten a waiver or not. Um, that's the managing uh, editor deals with that. And I, yeah, so that's, that's something I don't deal with any of the, the financial part, which in a way is, is good. So I just focus on the quality. And yes, there are a lot of journals out there now who are uh, become very 
uh, lenient, uh, even if they do some kind of peer review to publish. And that's, yeah, I, we have some discussion in our own uh, school too about whether those kind of journals are appropriate for uh, the tenure case because basically you pay and then you get published. That should not be the model. Okay, um, thank you so much. Uh, I think we are left with uh, almost uh, seven minutes. Um, I can see a couple of questions. I've got eight of them, but uh, to our participants, please forgive me. I'll just pick a few. Um, there's a question from, from Pascal. Uh, he says here, yeah, there is a tend to be more articles on traditional commons versus knowledge commons. Are your journals in general interested in knowledge commons? I think this one is directed to Mike. And then uh, there's another question which I see is of uh, interest. It says, what do you foresee as the impact of the COVID pandemic on the publishing sector? Over to you, Mike. Sure. So on the on the first question, we we had a, a an kind of an overview essay from the from the editors earlier this year at the beginning of the year that reviewed what we were seeing, what trends we were seeing in in the literature on the commons. We saw a, a big growth in the knowledge commons. We'd like to continue that. So if you have uh, research in this area, we would love to see it. We don't have, uh, uh, I don't believe we have a bias either way. I think we're seeing a growth in, in the knowledge commons. Um, of course, we still see plenty of traditional uh, work as well, but, but we're quite interested in, in both. We would actually like to see an expansion into, into new areas and fields where people are, are bringing uh, some of these ideas and relating them to others. So um, I would uh, like to say something about the COVID situation. Um, so one of the things I experienced is uh, it's, it's more difficult at the moment to get reviewers. Uh, a lot of people deal with all kinds of stresses uh, and um, related to, to COVID. Uh, and so uh, that's why uh, the review process takes a little bit longer now because a lot of people have more important things to do and uh, so so that that's that's a, a consequence uh, uh, now I do not know whether how this will impact the publishing sector the, probably there will be a uh, well we see an uptake in the number of, of, of papers but a, a reduction of the number of people who are willing to do reviews because of this situation so a little bit uh, uh, increased at least my uh, <laughs> Uh, the, the work uh, time for this, but uh, I don't know how this will impact uh, the broader publishing sector. And I, I would just add that there um, seems to be a clear uh, relationship, um, uh, a gendered response to, uh, with women facing the burdens, facing a, a larger share of the burden of childcare. Um, I see that, I, I've seen the, the statistics in terms of publication rates, um, declining as a result, but also in terms of response from reviewers that um, that many female reviewers have have made a comment about uh, having to deal with child child care and can't take reviews at the time. Okay, thank you. Arun, do you have any comments? I, I think what I would have said, both Marco and Mike have mentioned, so I, I personally also, the one thing I would say is that it does, COVID does affect the prospects of carrying out fieldwork and changes the kinds of fieldwork you can do. So that would likely have an impact on publications, especially on the commons, since a lot of the work that we do is ethnographic or fieldwork based. Uh, it would have some impact on that for sure. And uh, uh, yeah, but overall, I think the publishing industry is facing a lot of problems and uh, COVID uh, is unlikely to add to the problems of the publishers. It adds more to the problems that researchers and uh, uh, academics face. Okay. Um, 
I'm left with about six questions and these questions, they are quite long. So allow me to pick um, Maria's uh, question. Uh, she says here, yeah, often qualitative papers tend to be long and I appreciate Mike's point on the challenge that longer papers present in terms of relaying the key message to the readers and at the same time keeping them interested. Can the journals consider some writing workshops to guide early career researchers who are struggling to rise concisely and well summarized papers. Over to you, Mike. Can uh, the journals consider some writing workshops to guide uh, early career scientists? Um, in the past, we've, we've had some workshops in, uh, uh, um, at the, during or, or at conferences. Um, similar to this one, I could see us doing something similar um, for, for a, an, at another time on, 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 how to, on a, a writing workshop. Um, this is a tough one. It, it requires uh, strong mentorship, I think, and experienced uh, researchers or experienced scholars helping to, to guide this process, but it's, there's no magic answer to this one, I think, unfortunately. Uh, well, uh here, here, here is one suggestion. Uh, if I don't know if Marco, you and uh, Mike, you might be interested, we could we could consider organizing a, a, a day long or I mean when I say day long, I mean two hours or three hour long, maybe split over two days, uh, Zoom session where we would provide some feedback to authors uh, who are willing, interested in submitting their, their manuscripts or their abstracts for manuscripts uh, on the commons. And we could schedule it in, let's say, two or three months from now to give people some time to think about this invitation and uh, putting together something that, uh, that they feel they would like to publish. Yeah, I, I uh, agree uh, that will be a good idea. So we did a, a summer uh, school a few weeks ago where we had uh, about 20 people uh, participating. This was about the institutional analysis. And with each of the students, we had individual session on their uh, papers and chapters they were writing. And so we provide uh, feedback on that. So that was part of the, that summer school. Um, yeah, this, as, as Mike mentioned, this is a lot about um, uh, mentoring. It's often difficult for, for us to, to provide detailed feedback in because then you really have to get into the paper and you really, uh, so that's, that's often with my own students that, uh, that, uh, that you really get involved how to do it better. But I think we should be able to provide some, uh, uh, if well, there will be a number of um, uh, papers uh, submitted in a way for, for such a session, we can go through it and have some general lessons or general advice based on those cases. And that might be a useful learning exercise for a broader set of people. Yeah, I think that would be an interesting idea. Uh, would be a um, on, that. on that, Marco, um, there's a question here that says, any literature on commons that the editors can share? Like, I think uh, Maria is talking about maybe a website or... I don't well, know. yeah, well, the, the, uh, uh, if you go to the, uh, the website of the Institutional Analysis of the Commons, there you will find in resources a number of key uh, uh, publications. Um, there's also the Digital Library of the Commons, uh, uh, maintained by uh, uh, the Austin Workshop. Uh, that's also uh, mentioned on this uh, uh, resources uh, website. So, so those are some uh, places where you find a lot of common specific uh, literature. Okay, thank you. I can see that I'm left with, um, <laughs> with about uh, two minutes. Uh, what can I make one quick observation? Uh, yes. Just in regards to literature, uh, so you know, it is true that it's, it's that if you don't have access to, if a library does not have access to papers, it can be hard to get them. But I will say one thing to everybody who is here. If you write to an author 
asking them for a copy of the paper in which you are interested. Literally 1,000 times out of 1,000 times, you will get the paper from the author. Every single person will send you the paper and they'll probably send you a couple of other papers too. So yeah. never hesitate to write to an author asking for their work because you will get it from them. And, so, and use research uh, gate because that will be easier for us to send you papers. Yeah, I get many requests uh, a week and it's, it's just a few, few clicks with research gate. And uh, yeah, happy to do those things. Mm. Thank you so much. Sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but Alicia, go ahead. I would like to address, I see, I see if, I see one question I would like to address about uh, do we look at institutions of uh, authors submitted? I don't. Um, ex uh, it's not about the reputation. I may recognize names, but um, before I became editor in chief, I had a number of papers uh, uh, rejected by ecology and society. I was not grumpy uh, that I will not want to become the editor in chief. Uh, um, and I also reject papers of people who I may know, but if the, the, the reviews are in that indicate that there are problems, then it's, that's what we are focusing. I have to say that I sometimes give, if people are early career, I may give them more uh, benefit of the doubt uh, if there are issues. Then, and then I will pay more attention to provide, how to provide feedback that the person gets another chance to revise it. Um, so, but it's not that we, that if you are from a, a STEAM university, whatever that means, that you are more likely to get published. So, at least not with our journals, yeah. Interesting. Um, what would be your last words of advice to African scholars? I can start with you, Marco. Well, I think uh, uh, this, now I'm thinking about what I want to say, that might be a trap, but uh, think about, uh, uh, try to find some colleagues to write with. Don't, uh, it would be good to, to, to um, um, I learned a lot by writing with more senior scholars. Um, um, and so, that that's that's um, uh, that can be your mentor, but it could also be other uh, people. Uh, but don't send me now all kind of emails, <laughs> writing a paper with you. Um, but uh, th so that will be one way of learning uh, uh, from from some uh, colleagues. So um, so uh, collaboration with other people, and it could also be other other. Uh, other students or other early career scholars to, to work together on papers because you are um, uh, challenging each other to improve the quality. So that's one benefit of interdisciplinary work that you may improve each other's work. Uh, and so that uh, uh, will be one of the recommendations. It's not necessary for, for, for African scholars, but um, in terms of for African scholars that might be as as I, as we mentioned, there might be a lot of papers that may come uh, which might be less focused on the broader literature and more on a case study. So there you may, you know, so do I have to, if it, uh, with this question about uh, some working groups or working, so that's, so those might be interesting ways to find some mentoring advice because my interpretation is, it's not, uh, it's with a number of uh, areas around the world, they may have a different, they might have less critical mentoring than, than uh, we, we have received. I know from my advisor, I got in favor read many marks papers back every time I submitted it. And uh, so I learned to be very careful in my writing because I got it returned back from my advisor so many times. So, uh, so I got good uh, advice of how to improve the writing. And that might not everybody may have that guidance and, um, and we should see as journals what will be mechanisms to do that. But we cannot be your, come your co-supervisor. So it has to be some, so maybe the suggestion by Arun might be an interesting thing to explore. Thank you so much. Um, over to you, Arun, your last comments. 
I have uh, three words of advice. <laughs> One, uh, be confident. Confidence in yourself and what you want to do. Two, push yourself because there is no substitute for thinking deeply about something that you care about. And three, persist in what you want to do because you will uh, you will fail. And I say that not because I think you're not smart, but because I know that happens. I Most of my uh, grant submissions get rejected. The one thing that I heard from Eleanor Ostrom when I complained to her about it was that most of her grant proposals get rejected, which is not true, but she said that to me. <laughs> so persist because despite failure, you will succeed if you persist. So three things, be confident, push yourself, and persist in what you want to do. Thank you so much for, for those uh, powerful words. Uh, Mike? Yeah, so, so um, building from that and back to some of the, the practical suggestions. So the first is um, on that confidence that Arun talked about, um, submit, submit your papers. Don't let them sit there because you don't know if it's perfect or you have doubts about it. Find out. You'll, you'll see what people like and what they don't like very quickly. And that doesn't mean um, to send off a half-baked idea, but once, once you've put in the effort and have a paper that you think is ready, send it. Don't, uh, don't just wait and hope that it can get a little bit better. Um, it will get a little bit better. It will get a lot better once it's been reviewed and have, have people's comments and ideas. Reviews are meant to improve our work, not to uh, criticize our work, right? These are, these are um, efforts to, to make your work better. Um, so submit, um, as we, and then practically, as we said before, target the journal uh, in the way you write, in the format, in how you're doing um, your research, um, how you structure it, everything, target the journal. And then finally, before you send it, have someone read it. Make sure that it, 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 it reads uh, fine, that, that there's not a bunch of grammatical errors. And um, in, in that, it helps if it's someone that is also uh, experienced in the field. Uh, the, the mentorship that Marco talked about, that's invaluable. But at minimum, have an educated uh, layperson read it and just see if they can understand what you're talking about and if they get the main points. If they do, that's a good first step. Um, and I'll leave it at that. This has been uh, wonderful talking with you all. Okay, uh, I would like to thank our panelists. Thank you so much, uh, Marco, for organizing this webinar and Arun and Mike for joining us. Uh, and I would like to thank our participants for sending us questions. I think we answered nearly all of our questions. Uh, for those uh, who feel like their questions have not been answered fully. I think you can forward Marco an email. I think he will definitely help you and also Mike and Arun will help you out. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day, your morning or your evening. Thank you so much. Bye.